The story begins by the lake, as our hero finds the surroundings unfamiliar. He suddenly remembers, he was driving along on his scooter, when a vending machine ahead of him got loose, and it ends up smashing into him. He is surprised he is still alive, but he soon finds he is unable to move. He suddenly hears his voice, welcoming customers to use him, and he realizes he has been reincarnated as a vending machine. We learn he was actually a vending machine fanatic, so he is surprisingly happy about his new form. He admires his affordable products and sleek design, but he soon realizes his new form might be a problem. He wonders if it was thanks to God that he was turned into the thing he loved, and he decides to just accept things. He is able to say the standard things for a vending machine, such as insert a coin, and thanks for buying. He thinks about what else he can do, trying to understand his new body. He sees some writing, and he realizes it's the items he is selling. There are currently only two items, mineral water and corn soup. He hears a voice telling him that he can change the items by spending points, and he sees he has a thousand points. He learns that points are converted from money, which are then used to replenish or change the goods sold, or even gain additional functions. After further investigation, he learns that the points allow him to keep different items at different temperatures, and he is also able to warm up frozen food. He checks out what other items he has, and he finds he has a range of items that he would buy from vending machines when he was alive. He decides to try changing his item to milk tea, so he spends 10 points, and the milk teas appear inside him. It seems he can gain 1 point per 100 yen, and as he learns more about himself, he finds he doesn't require electricity for power, but he consumes his points for power instead. He uses 1 point per hour, which means he uses 24 points per day. Since he still has 990 points, he can operate for about a month, but he thinks he shouldn't waste his points until he can get a more steady income. But he realizes he is in the middle of nowhere, and after a day, he starts to panic, thinking he is doomed, because no one will ever use him. However, at that moment, a giant frog appears. It approaches him, but it gets startled by his voice welcoming it. The frog starts attacking him with its club, and his durability gets lowered. He learns that if his durability reaches zero, he will break and become unusable. The frog keeps on attacking him, and he sees his durability rapidly decreasing. He notices there is a magic stat, so he is surprised there is magic in this world. He is able to repair his durability with his points, so he thinks he can just wait for the frog to get bored, but the frog suddenly calls its friends. Seeing the frog's axe, he starts to panic, and he tries to find a function that will save him, but there is nothing useful. The frogs keep beating him up, but he suddenly notices he can gain a blessing from God. He is able to choose from a number of different abilities, so he gains the barrier ability, and he is able to push the frogs away. He thinks he is invincible, but his points start decreasing rapidly as the frogs keep on attacking him. The frogs eventually get bored, and he manages to survive. He uses his points to repair his durability, and we see he is down to 311 points. A few days later, he still hasn't been able to sell anything, but a girl suddenly appears. She is on alert at first, but she notes how she is starving, saying she isn't cut out to be a hunter. It seems she was hunting the frogs, but she hasn't had any luck. She notices the vending machine, but she is unfamiliar with what it can do. She is startled when she hears his voice, welcoming her and telling her to insert a coin. The girl wonders what kind of coins it takes. She tries a copper coin, but it's not accepted, and he learns he needs to acquire the coin conversion function to accept it. He quickly learns the skill for 100 points, and his prices change, allowing the girl to realize it will cost her one silver coin. She thinks it's expensive, but she decides to try it anyway because she is starving. He becomes excited to finally have his first sale, and the girl chooses his soup item. She takes it out from him, and she is surprised it is still hot. She tastes the soup, and she finds it delicious, saying it's better than anything else that's around. He is overwhelmed with pleasure to bring her such joy, and the girl wonders what other items he has. She enjoys his milk tea as well, and she ends up buying a few more corn soups. So he ended up making about 6 silver coins, which converts to 60 points. The girl ends up falling asleep beside him, but he protects her with his barrier, seeing her as a precious customer. When the girl wakes up, she thanks him for all the food, and she is startled when she hears his voice. She wonders if he is able to talk, 
because she knows someone who invents tools that have magical power, so she wonders if he can only say certain lines. She notices he can understand her, and they come up with a way to talk, where he will say hello to answer yes, and thank you to answer no. She introduces herself as Lamas, and she starts trying to learn more about him. He can't tell her his name, so she decides to call him Boxo. She wonders if he is lonely, and she suggests moving him. He agrees to this, and the girl suddenly picks him up. He can't believe she is so strong, but he is glad to finally move. It turns out Lamas has the blessing of might, which explains her insane strength. She takes a break after a while, wanting to have some more corn soup, but he thinks the soup isn't very filling, so he decides to find her something else. Lamas is surprised seeing he can change his items, and she decides to try it out. It's a can of potato chips, and she finds it absolutely delicious, eating multiple cans, and he manages to recover back up to 320 points. They make it back to the village, and the guards wonder what she has brought back. She explains it as a magical tool that can grant items in exchange for money, saying she found it by the lake. She wonders if it's okay to keep, and the guards mention it's normal for whoever finds something in a dungeon to become its rightful owner, and Boxo wonders if they are in a dungeon, but thinks it's not possible, because he is able to see the sky. The guards are surprised he can talk, so they think he could be sold for a high price, but Lamas says she is taking him to meet her friend. The guards try buying from him, and they are instantly impressed, going on to try all of his items. They tell Lamas to bring him around once in a while, and Boxo thinks business is looking up. They get inside the village, and Lamas notices a girl being bullied. She beats up one of the thugs, but we see that despite her strength, she struggles to land a hit on the man. The men decide to run away, and Lamas checks up on the girl. Lamas goes to the inn, and her friend Manami rushes to her, glad that she returned unarmed. It seems Lamas was left behind by some other hunters, but Manami tells her she has helped her spread bad rumors about them. She turns her attention to Boxo, and she thinks Lamas has brought back more junk, but Lamas claims he is super useful. As Lamas sets him up outside, Manami knows she wants to go to the surface to show Boxo off to her friend, but Manami wonders how she will pay for the transfer circle. Despite being able to see the sky, they are apparently in a dungeon called the Clearflow Lake. It seems a transfer circle is required to leave, but it seems Lamas has spent all her money on his items. Munami tells Lamas to make some money working at her inn, and she hopes Boxo will also help to attract customers. The people are soon attracted by how good his items are, and he is able to sell quite a lot. At night, Lamas takes him over to the guards at the gate, but they eventually get bored of his items, so he thinks it's time he added some new items. It seems he has been able to sell over 400 items, and he now has over 3000 points. He suddenly glows, and the guard is surprised to see there is a new item. It costs 3 silver coins, but the guard is excited to try something new. They wonder how to eat it, but there are luckily instructions on the can. It turns out to be stew, and the guards are impressed by the delicious flavors, wanting to buy even more. After a few days, word about his new item spreads around the village, and it seems to be a big hit. But during the day he makes it unavailable, so he doesn't compete with the inn's restaurant business. The girl that Lama saved approaches him, but she gets startled by his voice, so she throws a rock at him and runs away. Their days continue, as Lamas takes him over to the guards at night. She talks to him as they walk, and she hopes they can talk for real one day, which is why they need to get to her friend on the surface. Lamas is glad to have found him, and he thinks that being reincarnated as a vending machine isn't so bad. The next day, Boxo is terrified, when he finds himself confronted by a bear, but the bear actually turns out to be the director of the Hunters Association. He is impressed seeing Boxo, and he is there to ask for their help. He mentions that they are planning to attack the base of the frog monsters, and he wants them to come along. Lamas wonders why he wants to bring Boxo, since he can't fight, but the director says his ability to provide warm and ready-to-eat food on the go would be invaluable for the hunters, and he promises to keep them safe. Lamas isn't too sure, but Boxo thinks if they ignore the frog monsters, it might end up being dangerous for the village, so he agrees to go. They head off three days later, and we learn that it seems to be breeding season for the frogs, so there are an abnormally high number of them, and according to the director, they are making sure to protect the transfer circle in their village, because it's the key to getting in and out of the dungeon. 
Besides the hunters from the village, there are also a group of hunters known as the misfits, who are joining in on this raid, excited to make some money. The hunters take a break, and Lana sets Boxo down. She is approached by one of the hunters, who tells her not to be so worried, because they are there to protect them. He is interested seeing Boxo, and Lamas explains how to use him. The man decides to try it out, picking out a lemon tea, and he is impressed by the packaging. The man tries the drink, and he finds it delicious. He wonders where it all comes from, but Lamas mentions Boxo seems to just refill himself. The man becomes even more interested, so he calls over his vice captain Filmina. She addresses him as Captain Kelroy and Boxo is surprised to learn that he was the boss. Kelroy calls Filmina an expert about magic tools, so he asks her if she knows anything more about Boxo. She takes a look at him, but she ends up sensing no magic power from him, saying he just seems like a block of iron. Kelroy mentions how he magically seems to refill himself, thinking the items could be coming from another dimension, and Filmina suggests it could be the power of a blessing, but she finds it unlikely. Kelroy thinks it's a mystery, but decides to just be thankful to have him there. The director tells them they are camping for the night, and Boxo thinks it's his time to shine. Everyone lines up to buy from him, and we see he has added cup noodles for this expedition. Everyone finds it delicious, and Boxo takes note of a girl that seems to have a big appetite. Lamas gets to know her, and she introduces herself as Sui. Later at night, the director joins them, and he tells Lamas the frog den is about three hours away. He gives her the choice to either stay at the camp, or join the hunters on the battlefield. Lamas is okay with going since she is a hunter herself, but she worries about Boxo. However, Boxo says he doesn't mind, so they agree to join the battle as well. The next day, they reach the frog base, but there is a thick mist, and they are walking through mud. The director tells them to attack, and we see the hunters taking out the frogs. Kelroy tells his team they will get paid extra the more they kill, so they get fired up. Lamas wants to do her best, but Boxo worries for her, because she has trouble landing her hits. A frog suddenly jumps at her, but she easily blows it away. She is surprised she landed a hit, and it seems having Boxo on her back is giving her better balance. We see the Misfits team taking out the frogs, and Filmina uses water magic to take out three at once, but even more frogs appear and Kelroy finds it strange that there are so many. We see they are surrounded, and Boxo starts to get worried. The frogs charge at them, and Sui protects Lamas, but there is suddenly a frog that lunges for Sui. Lamas prepares to protect her, but Boxo's barrier blows the frog away. The girls are confused seeing the barrier, wondering what's going on, but Boxo is glad he protected them. He buys a new ability for a thousand points, to help expand his field of view. Lamas tells him to watch her back, and Kelroy compliments her on her strength. Lamas blushes hearing this, and Boxo warns her they are being attacked, but she is too distracted to hear him, so he ends up using his barrier again to blow them away. Kelroy is surprised seeing the barrier, and Lamas claims it must be Boxo's power, which makes Kelroy even more interested in him, but Boxo feels he might be dangerous. They end up beating all the frogs and Kelroy tells his team to cut their tongues so they can get paid by the association. Filmina tells him to help, saying it's gross, but Kelroy claims he became the captain so he wouldn't need to deal with that, causing his team to call him a tyrant. They wonder what they should do next, and Kelroy suggests they could help out on the front lines. Filmina reminds him their job is to protect Lamas and Boxo. Kelroy wants to make more money, saying he can give them all a bonus, and Filmina suggests it's up to Lamas. Kelroy begs Lamas to go, and Lamas is happy to help the hunters on the front lines. They take out some more frogs, and there are a bunch of hunters that are injured. Lamas carries them to the wagon, and Boxo thinks about how he can help. He comes up with an idea, and he decides to give them some drinks for free. The hunters are glad to have him, and the director thanks Kelroy for coming to their rescue. The director notes that there were twice as many frogs as expected, and Lamas wonders how it's possible. The director thinks it must mean that the Frog King has arisen, and Boxo imagines how strong it could be. The director asks for Kelroy's help to defeat it, and he tells Lamas to stay behind to help treat and feed the wounded hunters. Later that night, Lamas gets called away to help some of the other hunters, but there is a shady man that approaches Boxo. Boxo realizes he is after his money, so he gives him a free drink. But as the man tries to grab it, he burns the man's hand with a hot soup. 
Boxa laughs at him, but the man prepares to bust him open. However, Lamas returns just in time, and she ends up knocking him out, and the man is restrained. There is a disturbance in the distance, and the Frog King suddenly appears. The hunters wonder why it's there, and they all start to panic. Lamas loads Boxo on the wagon, but the pigs are too scared to move. Lamas ends up letting them go, and the hunters wonder what she is doing, but she ends up trying to pull the wagon with her strength. Boxo wonders what he should do, thinking his barrier isn't enough to save everyone. He tries to think of a way to slow down the monster, looking through his item list for ideas. He ends up buying coke, and Lamas thinks he has a plan. They grab the coke, and he buys the form change function, turning himself into a candy machine. He is filled with Mentos, and Lamas wonders what she needs to do. He struggles to explain his plan since he can't talk properly, so he just keeps telling her to insert coin. She doesn't understand what he is trying to tell her, and the Frog King approaches. The hunter thinks he must be broken, but Lamas can tell Boxo is trying his best. There's nothing Boxo can do, but the thief suddenly wakes up, seeing the Frog King, and he demands to be freed, not wanting to die. But a hunter stuffs his mouth to shut him up, but he starts to choke, so they give him some of the coke, causing him to explode. This gives Lamas an idea, and she figures out Boxo's plan. She explains it to the other hunters, and they end up using the coke to blast the frog in its eyes. Kelroy and the director make it back in time, and they manage to take out the Frog King. They all celebrate, and the director apologizes to Lamas for putting her in danger, and he thanks Boxo for saving them all, telling them their mission is complete. As they head back, they suddenly notice that the village was attacked. Lamas rushes back to the inn, but it's been completely destroyed, and she worries about Manami. However, Boxo manages to calm her down, and Lamas thinks Manami could have evacuated to the Hunters Association. We see a giant double-headed snake, which was responsible for all the damage, and Lamas finds the two guards. She asks about Manami and her mother, and the guards tell her they are safe inside. We see that the building is well guarded, because it's where the transfer circle is located. Munami welcomes Lamas back, and they are happy everyone is safe. Boxo thinks about helping the people, and he decides to give them all free items for the day. At night, we learn that the snake is normally the natural enemy of the frog monsters, and Boxo is surprised to see the villagers cooking it up for food. There's a huge line since he's giving away free items, and it even helps attract some new faces. He thinks it will make him even more money in the long run, and we see he has even started selling alcohol. Lamas gets a bit drunk, happy that everything turned out well. She is also happy seeing everyone gathered around him, and she thinks he has become an integral part of their lives. The next day, the people start the repairs, and Boxo is set up at the association, where there are plenty of people around. Lamas visits him, mentioning that the director gave her a personal request, and it's to help with removing the rubble. She takes Boxo over to the inn, and she starts moving the rocks, easily smashing them into pieces. Her cart gets full, and she prepares to take it to the dump, but Calroy suddenly appears. He offers to treat everyone to some of Boxo's items. Lamas gets excited, and Calroy tries to recruit her to his team, along with Boxo, but she instantly refuses. Calroy walks off rejected, and Lamas says she's too busy with helping rebuild the inn. The next day, Boxo is visited by a woman and her assistant. Lamas wonders who they are, and the woman introduces herself as a Kawi from the exchange house. She mentions they are there because it seems the village is low on silver coins. Lamas thinks it must be because Boxo only takes silver coins, and he can't believe she ratted him out. Akawi proposes exchanging for her gold coins, but Boxo isn't able to do it since he doesn't have an exchange function. Lamas suggests they could just buy something with a gold coin, and they will be able to get the silver coins as change. They end up with a whole chest full of silver coins, but the thief sees their exchange. Later on, we see an old man in front of Boxo, and we see he has added a lottery function. The man is devastated when he loses, wanting to spin again, but he ends up getting dragged off by his wife. The young girl Siori visits with a bunch of rocks to cause trouble, but she drops them all when she is startled by his voice, and she gets carried off by some men. As she approaches again the next day, she is disappointed that her father is away. Boxo can tell she is feeling down, so he gives her a free juice, and she thanks him. At night, Boxo gets set up at the bathhouse, 
and we see that he also sells hygiene products like shampoo. And he seems to be a big hit with the furry creatures. The next day, the old man is back, and this time with his granddaughter. He teaches her about the lottery function, and the girl is excited to try. She actually ends up winning, and her grandfather can't believe it. She gets an item for free, but she ends up just giving it to her grandfather to make him happy, saying she had a great time with him, and it seems Boxo rigged it for her. The next day, the director approaches Boxo. He heard that Boxo now has the ability to disguise himself, so he asks him to hide out where a bunch of crimes have been taking place, so he can help identify the culprit. He ends up being set up, right outside the front of the association. Lamas wonders where he has gone, but Monami reminds her the director was borrowing him, so Lamas continues to help around the association. Boxo has a quiet day, but we see Siori looking around for him. She runs into Lamas, and she wonders if she has given any more thought to her proposal. However, Lamas says she's not going to sell Boxo. Siori says she would have enough money for the rest of her life, but Lamas refuses, saying Boxo is irreplaceable. Siori wonders what Boxo truly is, but even Lamas isn't sure. She thinks that since he can understand and respond to everything, she sees him the same as another person, and Boxo is happy to hear she feels this way. Siori declares she will get Boxo one way or another, but she leaves for the day, telling Lamas to take care of him until that day comes. Boxo reappears, and Lamas is shocked to see him, but she tells him she missed him, and she is excited to tell him about her day. The next day, we see Boxo as he gets wheeled around on a cart, but it turns out he has actually been kidnapped, and he wonders where he's being taken. A few hours earlier, we see Boxo getting approached by a group of men. They tell him they were hired by the director to help reinforce the walls, so they tell him the director wants him to go with them so he can help feed the workers. Boxo notices the shady guy that tried to steal from him, but he thinks he must be reformed since he's working for the director. He agrees to go with them, so the men load him onto their cart, but after eight hours, he comes to the realization of what's really going on. He wonders how far they are going, and they eventually stop to have a break. While they are stopped, Boxo takes the chance to use his security camera to take photos of all of their faces. He's approached by the thief, and the man threatens him to give them food. Boxo refuses, so the man stabs him, causing him to take some damage. But the boss reprimands the thief, telling him not to damage the merchandise. The boss tells Boxo to hand over all his money, but Boxo refuses. They know Boxo is able to repair himself, so the boss tells his men to rough him up. The men start bashing into him, and although the damage isn't a lot, he wonders if there's anything he can do about it. He gets a notification that he can enhance his toughness by spending a thousand points, and it instantly makes him tougher, reducing the damage from the attacks to zero. The boss notices that Boxo doesn't seem to be repairing, getting worried they may have broken him, but the thief assures him it's fine. Boxo gives them some drinks, and the man is relieved he is still working. They all try out the drink, but it turns out to be disgusting, because it was Boxo's lowest rated drink. They reach their base at night, and Boxo gets taken inside. They tell a woman to take a look at him, but they get scared as she approaches, so they just throw her the instructions and quickly run away. The woman starts talking to Boxo, and he wonders if he should answer honestly. The woman introduces herself as Hulami, and Boxo recognizes her as Lamas's friend. She's actually a magic item engineer, and it turns out she was also kidnapped. Boxo starts talking to her, and she is instantly impressed to see a magic item that can understand and speak with people. She reads the instructions, and she soon figures out how he can communicate. Hulami reveals she has experimented with trying to give magic items human intelligence, but concluded it's not possible with their technology, so she started thinking about putting a human soul into an item instead. Boxo is amazed she figured it out, and Hulami says she needs a drink from all her excitement. Boxo gives her one of his milk teas, and she finds it delicious. They keep on talking, and Boxo confirms he actually has a human soul and has memories of his past. Hulami wonders why he requires money, because normal magic items don't require any. Boxo decides to show her, transforming into his other form, and Hulami realizes he must use the money to gain additional functions. She wonders what else he can do, so he shows her his barrier skill. She thinks it's some kind of wall, but Boxo lets her pass through, and Hulami is amazed he can even use a blessing, 
but Boxo is impressed she is working everything out so quickly. Hulami goes to sleep, and Boxo wonders if the people in the village have noticed that he's missing. At that moment, the bandits return, wanting to get payback on Hulami for scaring them, but Boxo suddenly transforms, turning into a magazine dispenser, and he instantly attracts the men. The men become too distracted, and they all decide to head back to their rooms, saying they have business to take care of. The next day, a man comes in to give Hulami her food. Hulami is disappointed seeing a single loaf of bread, so Boxo decides to give her some of his food. He treats her to all kinds of different foods, and she thinks he is even better than a restaurant. Hulami is completely stuffed, but the boss enters, wanting to know what she has figured out. Hulami doesn't want to cooperate, but the boss tells her she has two days to figure out how to get Boxo's money, so Boxo thinks they need to find a way to escape before then. Hulami continues on with examining him, and their time is running out. Boxo thinks about making a distraction to give Hulami a chance to get away, but Hulami has a serious talk with him, telling him not to think about sacrificing himself, because the area is surrounded by monsters, so even if she got away, she wouldn't be able to survive. She gets tired, so she calls it for the night, but Boxo wonders what to do about their deadline. During the night, there is suddenly a commotion outside, so he quickly wakes Hulami up. They realize there's a fight going on outside, and they suddenly hear Lamas' voice. We see the fight outside, and Lamas calls for Boxo, charging into the building. Hulami is surprised that Boxo is friends with Lamas, and she thinks they should be fine to just wait to be rescued. But Hulami suddenly thinks they could be in trouble, because besides storing all their gold here, the bandits also have explosives. Boxo worries hearing this, and some of the explosives go off, causing the ceiling to come crashing down, but Boxo protects them with his barrier. Hulami wonders if he can hold the barrier forever, but he admits that he can't. He thinks he would survive being crushed since he upgraded his toughness, but he worries for Hulami. Hulami realizes that his ability must use money, so she points out the bandit's stash of gold. Boxo lets it through his barrier, and he jacks up the prices on all his items, while Hulami deposits all the money into him. Boxo gains an insane number of points, and he thinks he'll be able to hold out until Lama saves them, but Hulami suddenly collapses. Boxo realizes she can't breathe, because his barrier also stops air from getting in. He thinks about what he can do, and he suddenly transforms, turning into an oxygen vending machine. Hulami is able to breathe, and Boxo is glad he was a vending machine fanatic in his past knowing that in 1965, there were oxygen vending machines because there were concerns about air pollution. Hulami thinks she would fall for him if he were a man, and even Boxo is charmed by her. Lamas makes it to them, and she is overjoyed to finally find him. She slips through the barrier, crashing into him, but she cries thinking she had lost him. She hugs onto him, apologizing for not watching him, and he is glad to be reunited with her as well. Lamas eventually realizes Hulami is also there, and Hulami is glad they got out safely. Filmina wonders why Kalroy helped out, when there was no money involved. Kalroy says he's just a nice guy, but Filmina knows he is trying to gain a favor from Boxo, and Kalroy says they will achieve their dream by any means necessary. We see Lamas as a child, using her strength to catch fish with Hulami. Hulami thinks her parents will be happy, but we learn Lamas gets into trouble for constantly breaking things at home. She suddenly stands before Boxo, where she thanks him for saving her, but we see she is just dreaming, telling him not to leave her again. Hulami tells Boxo that after he was abducted, Lamas kept looking for him and didn't even sleep. She mentions their past, revealing that their village was wiped out and Lamas lost her parents. Despite having her strength, she was too scared to do anything, and it became her biggest regret. Boxo wants to do whatever he can to help her, and she dreams they'll be together forever. The next day, Hulami decides to stick around in the village, and Lamas heads off to do some work. Hulami and Boxo get approached by Sui's bodyguards. The man tells them that Sui will be coming to make a request from them, and he hopes that they will accept the request. The men panic as they hear Sui approaching, so they quickly leave. Sui introduces herself to Hulami, and she asks for a favor. Hulami wonders what she wants, and Sui explains there is a gathering of merchant families where they reveal their newest magic items. The organizer is her rival Kana, and she gets mad even thinking about her. 
Hulami thinks it sounds interesting, and Boxo agrees as well. They go over to the event, and Boxo looks around for Sui's rival. Sui approaches her, and they pretend to get along. Kana checks out the competition, looking over at Hulami and Boxo, but she is confident she will win. The presentations begin, and we see the first participant show off his latest invention. He introduces it as a magic weapon that can transform. Hulami thinks it's a good idea, but it turns out he is just putting different attachments onto a stick, and everyone is disappointed. After a number of other lackluster presentations, Hulami starts to get bored, but it comes to Kana's turn. Her engineer reveals a robot, claiming he has succeeded in a dream of giving intelligence to a magic item. Hulami is shocked, thinking he must have put someone's soul inside the robot, and she notes that it's banned by the Magic Engineer Association because it's too dangerous, mentioning that a whole town was destroyed in the past because of it. The robot impresses everyone as it can follow commands, but it suddenly starts to go wild, wanting to kill everyone. The man tries to turn it off, but he gets thrown away, as the robot blames him for awakening it. Hulami orders Sui's men to help out, but they all get thrown away. Hulami jumps onto it, targeting its magic seal, and she manages to turn it off, apologizing to the soul that was used. The crowd suddenly realizes who Hulami is, and we learn she has quite the reputation for being a troublemaker. Hulami claims all her incidents were from her youth, and Sui declares her victory over Kana. After some time, winter arrives and we see all of the town's restaurant owners in a meeting led by Monami. They discuss the arrival of a popular chain restaurant, and they worry about going out of business. Munami reveals Boxo as their secret weapon, and she bribes him by giving Lamas a discount at the inn. We see the restaurant has opened up, and they have a huge line of people wanting to get in. Lamas and Hilami go and try out the food, but they find it's pretty average, thinking it doesn't even compare to Boxo's food. Lamas thinks the food is bland, and Boxo thinks that it's because seasoning isn't cheap in this world, but this gives him an idea. In Munami's next meeting, she thinks that they need to come up with a new menu to save their customers. They all bring out their latest creations, and Lamas and Hilami taste test the food. They give suggestions on how to make it better, while Boxo transforms, giving them a sample of what it should taste like. All the owners rush to get advice, and they become inspired by Boxo's samples. We see that at the chain restaurant, all the owners have set up food stalls outside, offering their new dishes, and they start to attract the people waiting in line. The people are amazed by all the new foods, turning out to be a huge success, and the restaurant ends up going out of business and closing down. As all the owners celebrate, Kelroy approaches Boxo. He tries to invite Boxo on a campaign, but Boxo instantly declines. Kelroy reminds him how he helped out when he got abducted, and Boxo considers changing his mind, but Kelroy tells him to talk it over with Lamas. Hulami thinks that most people would want the opportunity to join Kelroy's group, and she wonders what Lamas wants. Lamas says she wants to fight so she can get stronger, but Hulami wonders if she is after revenge, and Boxo wants to help her in any way he can, turning into a flower machine, and he cheers Lamas up. Boxo thinks about what Hulami told him about Lamas's past, and as spring approaches, when the hunters will become active again, he wants to be able to protect her. He is suddenly approached by a girl, but she quickly hides behind him as the guards approach. The guard gets some stew, and his friend wonders why he keeps eating the same thing, but the guard insists it's his favorite. We learn that the girl is into him, but she's just too shy to make a move. Boxo decides to help her out, transforming into a new form and giving her some vegetables. He gives her a bunch of other ingredients as well, and she realizes he is telling her to cook the man his favorite stew. The girl thanks him, and we learn they ended up getting together. Spring arrives, and it seems Lamas and Boxo have agreed to go on Kelroy's expedition. We learn they are going to check up on the crocodile monsters, since they are one of the three main monster factions in their area, and after dealing with the frog boss and the twin head snake, they are going to check to see if the crocodile monsters have overmultiplied as well. The group prepares to leave, and Hulami reveals she is also going, saying that the director hired her to perform an ecology survey. They head off, and Kelroy is glad to finally get out of the town. They are suddenly attacked by some frog monsters, but the group easily fights them off. Lamas wants to get involved, and she thinks about throwing rocks. Boxo thinks throwing would be a good use of her strength, so he gives her a reinforced bottle to throw. She gives it her best, 
but she ends up completely missing. The group stops for a break, and they enjoy all of Boxo's food. They are glad they don't need to hunt for their food. Boxo shows off his new function, adding on an emergency box, and it turns out to contain the parts of a portable toilet. The group thinks it's amazing, and Kelroy tries to take credit for it since he convinced Boxo to join, but the group doesn't buy it. They continue on, and Kelroy mentions they are entering the crocodile's territory. He decides to send Akka and Shiro to scout, so they head off while the rest of the group waits. When they return, they report that they found a group of around 30 crocodiles. Hulami mentions that a normal group is between 10 to 50, and Kelroy thinks that since there aren't an abnormally large amount of them, they can just leave them alone. But Filmina mentions that the crocodiles go for a high price, so she wants to take them out. Kelroy ends up agreeing, and they decide to rest up for the night. As they sleep, we see Hulami telling Lamas to be careful. She wishes there was something she could do for the fight, mentioning the crocodiles are weak to the cold, and Boxo suddenly turns into an ice machine. Hulami gets an idea, wondering how much ice he can make, and we see Boxo dumping ice into the river the next day. The crocodiles end up all getting out from the cold, and Kelroy thinks this is their chance. He asks Filmina to create a fog, but she says she can't cover such a large area. They wonder what they should do, and Boxo turns into another machine. He starts dumping dry ice into the river, and it creates fog over the whole area. Kelroy tries to take credit once again, but Filmina says Boxo is more useful than him. Kelroy gets depressed thinking he is useless, but they end up heading off to hunt the crocodiles. Hulami is left with Boxo, and she explains her real mission from the director is to investigate the appearances of the boss monsters. They are meant to be quite rare, but after two of them have appeared, she wonders if something is going on. There is suddenly a huge crash, and the group comes rushing back. We see Llamas unconscious, and they are being chased by the crocodile boss. Kelroy tells Hulami to jump on, but she doesn't want to leave Boxo. However, he pushes her away with his barrier, and Kelroy grabs onto her. Boxo transforms and starts making noise to grab the boss's attention. He upgrades his durability and his toughness, but he still gets blown away by the boss, and he loses a thousand points from the hit. Boxo thinks his barrier won't be enough. He wants to protect the group, so he transforms once again, and he shoots some fried chicken lunches at the boss. The boss starts to eat it, so he spits out a whole mountain of them, but the boss ends up eating him in a single bite. Boxo finds himself inside the boss's stomach, and he notices his points are rapidly decreasing. He transforms into a laundry dispenser, attacking with Tide Pods, and it starts to give the boss a stomachache. Boxo knows it's not enough, so he turns into a gas machine, and he fills the boss's insides with gas. He then turns into his heating mode, and he summons a can into his microwave. Together with some paper, he heats it all up, and he manages to start a fire. He shoots it out of his barrier, causing an enormous explosion, and we see Boxo is the only thing that remains. The boss drops a special coin, but as he takes it, the ground suddenly splits, and Boxo falls through the ground. As he falls, he thinks about what he can do. He transforms into a balloon vending machine, and he starts inflating balloons, and he is able to fill his barrier full of balloons. However, it's not enough to slow him down, so he transforms into a cardboard vending machine and becomes much lighter. He finds there's a huge labyrinth beneath him, and he decides to use his camera to take some photos from above. He manages to land safely, and he notices the coin from the crocodile on the ground. He can't pick it up, so he thinks about unlocking some new functions. He is shocked to see he has over a million points, and he realizes he must have got them from defeating the crocodile boss. He wonders what he can do with a million points, and he sees he can level up his vending machine rank. He increases his rank to 2, boosting some of his stats and unlocking more options for his transformations. He transforms into a vacuum machine that you would see at a car wash, and he is able to suck up the boss's coin, but when he examines it, it doesn't seem to do anything at the moment. He suddenly starts flashing red, and he gets a warning that his transformation time for the day is about to exceed 2 hours. He quickly turns back to his original form, and he is shocked he had such a limitation. The day goes by, and he hasn't seen a single person go by, but he just enjoys his time in the sun, revealing that he added a new solar panel function that allows him to save his points when the sun is out. There are suddenly four bear creatures running toward him, 
It turns out they are being chased by pig fiends, and one of them is injured. Boxo decides to help them out, using his camouflage to hide. He then activates his barrier to shoot out drinks at the pigs, hitting them in the face and driving them off. The bears wonder what happened, and Boxo quickly reveals himself. They wonder what he is, but when he speaks, the bears are terrified and back away. Boxo thinks there is only hope, so he quickly transforms into a food machine and throws out a box of fried chicken. The bears admire the smell, and the one named Suko realizes he might be a box that sells food, but the leader Mikan worries it could be a trap. However, they just can't resist, and the one named Pell eats the chicken, finding it delicious. The other two rush over, buying another box, and they also find it delicious. Mikan can't resist, so he also joins in, and he can't believe how good it tastes. After eating a whole mountain of chicken, Pell thinks they should go home, but Mikan says they haven't found any treasure yet. However, Suko points out Boxo, thinking he is the best kind of treasure, but Boxo tries to say that he won't be their property. The bears are shocked when they hear him saying different lines, and they wonder if he can actually understand them. Boxo tries communicating with them, but in the end, Mikan can't work it out, and thinks he is just saying random lines. They decide to take him back to the entrance, but he's way too heavy for them to move. Boxo thinks about turning into cardboard again, but thinks that would scare them off, so he adds wheels to himself instead. The bears push him along, and they approach the area where the pig fiends attacked them earlier. Boxo decides to show off his barrier, but the bears start freaking out. He lets them out of his barrier, but they start to find him suspicious. Boxo tries to communicate with them again, using a new function to display text, but the bears can't understand Japanese, so they aren't able to read it. The bears think they should just leave him behind, but Boxo quickly drops more fried chicken, and they easily change their minds about him. The pig fiends suddenly come rushing over, and Boxo turns into a gas pump, but realizes he can't move his nozzle. However, the ground shakes, and the nozzle comes loose, allowing him to spread his gas, causing all the pigs to slip. But the ground keeps shaking, as an enormous flaming skeleton appears. Mikan recognizes it as the boss, and he tells the others to run. They rush away with Boxo, and the boss ends up eating the pigs. They manage to get away, and they end up spending the night in the labyrinth. While the bears sleep, Boxo notices some flaming skulls approaching. He makes as much noise as he can, and he manages to wake up the bears. Mikan says they need to deal with them, or they could end up calling the boss. They wonder how to fight them, and Boxo quickly gives them water. The bears throw water on the skulls, and Mikan is able to finish them off. Pell thinks Boxo is amazing, since he helped them with exactly what they needed, and Boxo thinks this is his chance to communicate with them, but Mikan says it's just his imagination, saying it was a coincidence. The next day, they continue toward the entrance, but they hear a fight going on up ahead. Kuro runs up to scout ahead, and he returns to tell them it's safe, saying he saw the director, as well as an abnormally strong girl. We see Lamas as she defeats a pig fiend, calling out for Boxo. She sees him approaching, and she instantly rushes to hug him. We see Hulami and Kelroy's group are also with her, and they are glad to finally find him. The bears greet the director, and the director thanks them for saving Boxo. Mikan wonders what Boxo is, and the director introduces Boxo as a resident of their village. Mikan wonders how a magic item could be a resident, but the director explains that Boxo can understand them. Mikan finds it hard to believe, pointing out how Boxo just says random lines, but Lamas explains their communication system, and the bears are shocked to learn that he could understand them the whole time. They manage to get out of the labyrinth, and the director reveals they had a second objective besides saving him, mentioning that Kelroy's group wants to defeat the skeleton boss. Kelroy explains that everyone in his group has a goal, and they are determined to achieve them no matter what. He goes on to explain the legend of the labyrinth, where it's said that if you can reach the lowest level and meet the requirements, you can have any wish granted. Lamas wonders about the requirement, and Kelroy believes it's the coin that drops when a boss is defeated. Boxo is surprised to hear his coin is so valuable, and Kelroy says that among his group, they have six wishes that they want to achieve. They currently have three coins, and they have been going around to different areas whenever they hear that a boss has appeared. Kelroy knows he got a coin from the crocodile boss, and he suggests working together, saying it would even be possible for him to turn into a human. 
Lamas gets excited hearing this, and they end up agreeing to join Kelroy's group, but Boxo isn't quite sure about turning back into a human. They prepare to head back into the labyrinth, and the director shows them a map to prepare. Boxo notices it isn't quite accurate, and he manages to show the pictures he took when he was falling down. The director is impressed, and promises to give him a bonus when they get back. They head into the labyrinth, and they discuss the plan to defeat the skeleton boss. The director reveals a trap that was discovered by some other hunters, and they plan to lure the boss into the pit. Kelroy thinks it probably won't be enough to take it out, and its flaming body would melt any attacks that they try, so he thinks about using Filmina's water magic and Boxo's water to fill the pit, hoping to put out the boss's flames. He asks Boxo if he can produce enough water, but Boxo thinks if he just used his water bottles, it could take days to fill up. But he suddenly gets an idea, transforming into a pressure washing machine, and he's able to let out much more water. Everyone is impressed, but Boxo thinks about his limited transformation time. After two days, Boxo sprays water as a power washer for two hours each day, and has the bears throw in water bottles the rest of the time. Meekin gets lowered into the pit to check the water level, but it seems the ground has absorbed all of the water, and none of it is left. The group becomes discouraged, but Boxo comes up with another plan, turning into an ice machine, and he starts dumping ice into the pit instead. At night, Lamas asks Boxo if there's something on his mind, because she has noticed that his light flickers when he's thinking. She asks how he feels about becoming a human, but Boxo isn't sure. He wants to be able to talk to her as a person, but as he thinks about becoming a human, he worries he will become useless. Everyone finds him incredibly useful, but he thinks that without his vending machine powers, people will no longer need him, so he's scared of this reality. Lamas tells him how she wants to be able to talk with him and cook for him, giving him the courage to want to be a human. After another few days, the pit is finally ready. Hulami wonders if the ice will be enough, thinking the boss's flames might instantly vaporize it all. The boss appears, and it starts to approach them. Meekin triggers the trap, and the boss falls right in. Hulami warns everyone to watch out for steam, but nothing comes out, and Meekin points out that the fire is out. Hulami wonders how it's possible, and it turns out Boxo actually filled the pit with dry ice, which actually caused the pit to be filled with carbon dioxide, and since fire can't burn without oxygen, its fire was extinguished. The group starts throwing rocks down at the boss, but Meekin thinks it's not enough damage, suggesting that they throw something heavier. Kelroy's group starts looking at Boxo, thinking they could throw him, but Lamas refuses to let them do that. Kelroy thinks they could jump down and defeat it, since its flames are gone, but Boxo warns them not to go, because they won't be able to breathe. But the boss starts climbing up, and Kelroy thinks they have no choice but to jump in. Boxo starts to panic, and he suddenly transforms into a magazine dispenser. Lamas becomes flustered, and she ends up slapping him, causing him to go flying, but he thanks her, as he transforms into his heaviest form, smashing right through the boss. The boss is defeated, and Boxo sucks up another boss coin. He uses his balloons and his cardboard form to fly out of the pit. Meekin closes the trap, and Boxo lands safely. Lamas tells him he was too reckless, but Boxo is just glad that everyone is safe. Kelroy asks about the boss's coin, and Boxo prepares to give it to him, but Hulami grabs it first, saying that the coin rightfully belongs to Boxo. Kelroy agrees, and he offers to buy it for a hundred gold coins. Boxo can't believe he offered so much, and he thinks he doesn't need more than one, so he agrees to sell it to Kelroy, and the group heads back to the village. They stop by the Hunters Association branch near the labyrinth, and Kelroy's group leaves using a transfer circle. But Lamas and Hulami stay behind, because the director gave them a mission to survey the perimeter of the labyrinth. A hunter named Miguel enters, and all the girls are instantly charmed by him. Even Lamas thinks he must be some sort of hero, and Boxo gets a bit jealous. He asks for a map of the labyrinth, and the girls tell him it will take a few days to give him an updated map, so he decides to come back another time. At night, we see that Miguel isn't quite the hero Lamas was thinking about, and we learn he only came to the labyrinth because he heard there weren't many people. He bumps into Boxo, and it turns out he gets nervous just talking to people. He doesn't know why everyone stares at him, finding it scary, and Boxo is surprised to see this is what he's really like. 
he starts having a nervous breakdown, and Boxo feels bad for him, so he gives him a drink to help him calm down. The next day, Lamas tells Boxo that Miguel is joining them on their job. They head off together, but when Lamas tries to get to know Miguel, all he can do is play it cool and agree. When Hilami asks him questions as well, he gets nervous and ends up running off to guard the rear instead. Boxo feels bad for him, but it seems Miguel is trying to improve his communication skills. After a week of traveling, Lama seems to be feeling unwell. Hulami worries about her, telling her to ride on the cart, but Lamas decides to keep going. However, she suddenly gets weak, but Miguel catches her just in time. They stop for a break, and it turns out to be Lamas's time of the month. Boxo thinks about what he can do to help, and he turns into a hygiene product dispenser. Hulami wonders what his item can do, but when she sees how absorptive it is, she realizes how to use it. After that, Boxo even turns into a washing machine, and he takes care of all of Lamas' clothes. After two weeks of traveling together, Miguel has started warming up to the group, finally able to eat with everyone. Mikan smells something up ahead, and he tells the group to stop. Pell senses it as well, and he can tell there is a group of men up ahead. Hulami finds this strange, because there shouldn't be anyone out in the middle of nowhere. Miguel gets nervous hearing this, and he tells the group that the men are probably after him, so he thinks he should leave so he doesn't cause them trouble, but Lamas doesn't want to let him go. Hulami wonders why he is being targeted, but Miguel isn't able to say. Hulami tells him there's no need to worry about their safety, because Boxo will be able to protect them. Boxo shows off his barrier, and Hulami tells him to test it, telling him to stay if Boxo can block his attack. Miguel agrees to this, and he prepares to go all out. He unleashes a lightning dragon, but the barrier is able to stop it. It does 500 points worth of damage, and Boxo is shocked it was so much, thinking it was almost as strong as the crocodile boss's attack. They continue on foot, and Miguel can sense that there are three swordsmen and two magic users. Lamas is amazed he can sense them from so far away, and we see the men approaching them. The leader reveals they are there for Miguel's life, and he wonders if Lamas and Mikan are his companions, but Miguel says they are unrelated, telling the man to leave them alone. The man agrees not to harm them if he doesn't resist, but Miguel doesn't trust him, so he decides to fight. Lamas and Mikan run off, drawing the two magic users. The mages attack, but Boxo blocks it with his barrier. He then transforms into his washing mode, and Lamas sprays the men with water. She then attacks with soap, blinding their vision, and she easily finishes them off. Miguel fights against the leader, but in an instant, he is able to take him out. Miguel thanks Lamas for her help, and he tells them to get the others while he gets information from the men. When they regroup, Miguel isn't able to say why he's being targeted, and he thinks it's too dangerous to keep traveling together, so he thinks it's time they part ways, but Lamas suggests he should join Kelroy's group saying they don't care about a person's past as long as they are strong. Miguel agrees to get in touch with them, but when he leaves, he just can't handle meeting more people. The group makes it back to the village, but when they check in at the guild, the clerk finds it strange because he thought Boxo was already back. It turns out that at the closed-down chain restaurant, there are some vending machines, but when they try it out, it's actually just a person inside, and they are just selling the food from the restaurant. Lamas and Hilami aren't impressed, and after a week of Boxo being back in the village, the restaurant is once again out of business. Munami holds another meeting with the restaurant owners, and she suggests holding an eating competition. The repairs to the village are almost complete, so she thinks the contest would be a good way to attract more people. The other owners think it's a good idea, and they decide to hold it in two weeks' time. But after a week, we see the restaurant owners asking Boxo for help and Hilami wonders if there's a problem with the contest. Munami says it was all going great, until they realize that Sui and the band of bears would be entering, and they are all known for their insane appetites, so the restaurant owners think they are going to go broke running the competition. Lamas wonders if Boxo can help them, and he ends up thinking of giving the contestants cola, because the bubbles will fill them up. Lamas thinks the contestants might complain, because the people drinking water will have an advantage. The owners decide to market the drink before the event at a higher price, and then on the day of the contest, they'll give it out for free, so the people will be more likely to want it. They all thank Boxo for his help, 
and Minami hopes he can continue to help if they have any more problems. On the day of the competition, we see the event has attracted a large amount of spectators, and Minami reveals there were so many entries that they need to have two preliminary rounds, with the top five of each group moving on to the finals. The first group of contestants take their place, and we see the band of bears are in this group. Munami tells them they need to finish all the food before the time runs out, but after just a moment, the bears have already finished, taking four of the slots, and one of the hunters take the final spot. In the next group of contestants, we see Sui, and even Lamas is giving it a go. Munami starts the round, and Sui seems to be quite relaxed, but she devours her plate, and she's the first to finish. The time starts to run out, but we see Lamas manages to finish just in time, they move on to the finals, and Boxo has unlocked a new form, playing music as a jukebox to set the mood. The contestants prepare to eat, and Munami tells them that whoever eats the most during the time limit will be the winner and get a special prize. They all start eating the food, and we see Sui easily devouring the first dish. The second dish is a fruit crepe, but she eats it all in a single bite. The bears manage to keep up with her, but she's just too fast, and she ends up winning the competition. She is given her prize, but when she opens it, she finds it's empty. However, Munami reveals that the prize is being able to use Boxo, and he will do anything she wants for a day. Boxo is surprised to hear this, but Munami begs him to go along with it and help her out. The next day, Sui brags to Aka and Shiro about her prize. Kelroy gets excited, thinking they can use Boxo on Monster Hunt, but Sui says she isn't planning on sharing him, and she has other plans. They head into the original dungeon, and they reach a small house. There are a bunch of kids that come out to greet her, and her master Mia welcomes her back. Sui shows off Boxo to the kids, and they all try out his food. Boxo is happy seeing all their smiles, and he even turns into a balloon machine, giving them all balloons. After that, Lamas plays with them, spraying them with water, and Boxo does their laundry afterward. Sui tells them to take a bath while they wait, but they find they are out of hot water. Mia thinks they will need to skip baths for that day, but Boxo comes to the rescue, and he is able to fill it up with hot water. They all have a relaxing bath together, and Mia thanks Boxo for his help. At night, they have more of his food for dinner, and Lamas is glad they could make so many kids happy. After they all go to sleep, Sui thanks Boxo for everything that he did. She thinks it must have been expensive to give out so much food, and she promises to find a way to repay him, but he tells her it's not necessary. Sui goes on to talk about the original dungeon, saying it's the first place that everyone must go through, and the only way to leave is to make it to the transfer circle. There are many children that get abandoned here, and Sui reveals that her wish is for everyone here to be happy. Meanwhile, we see a group of men approaching, and it seems they are after Boxo, hearing he can produce unlimited food. Boxo thinks about waking everybody up, but he worries it could put the children in danger. So he transforms into his dry eyes machine, creating a fog which spooks the men, and then using his barrier, he fires eyes at the men, causing them to run away. In the morning, Boxo shows the others what happened at night, and Sui recognizes them as former hunters who have a base nearby. Mia leaves Sui to watch the children, and she heads off to teach the men a lesson. Lamas wonders if she'll be okay by herself, but Sui notes that Mia is an expert hunter, and even Kelroy is afraid of her. Lamas meets back up with Kelroy, but she freaks out when she finds out they are planning a campaign in the dead zone, because it's an area filled with all kinds of skeletons and monsters, and Boxo is surprised to see her so scared. It seems Lamas is too terrified to go, so Kelroy wonders if there's any other way for them to take Boxo. Filmina worries about having enough food during a long campaign while they are looking for the boss, but Lama suddenly claims she isn't a child, saying she's not scared, and she agrees to go with them. They prepare to head off, but Lamas notices Filmina isn't with them. They tell her she scares easy, so she isn't coming along, and Lamas realizes she was tricked. They arrive in the dead zone, and we see all the buildings are abandoned. Lamas tries her best to keep her cool, and they arrive at the inn. Lamas is scared seeing a picture of a woman, but when she appears behind her, Lamas instantly passes out. Kelroy takes her to one of the rooms, and Boxo is set up outside the inn. Hulami tells him more about how Lamas was even easier to scare when she was younger, 
and she can't believe Lamas hasn't already run away. At night, there are ghosts that appear, and Boxo becomes surrounded by all kinds of monsters, but they just seem to be wandering around. He puts up his barrier just in case, and he decides to try out his undead repelling items. He starts off by throwing salt at them, but it seems to have no effect, so he transforms into a figurine machine, throwing statues and other religious items at the creatures, but that also does nothing. In the morning, Hulami checks on him, but is shocked when she sees all of his items on the floor, wondering what's going on. Sui and the others go out to explore, and Kalroy also leaves to find more reinforcements. Boxo is approached by the innkeeper, and she wonders what he thinks about the monsters. She explains that they envy the living, which is why they didn't even bother attacking him, since he's just an object to them. Lamas is depressed, because she is still scared of the area, but Hulami tries to cheer her up, saying she will help her overcome her fears. Lamas gets excited by the idea, but when Hulami tells her to start by walking around the village, she's scared once again. Hulami tells her to buy some potions from the store, but when she goes to take Boxo along, Hulami tells her she needs to go alone. Lamas agrees to prove herself, but when she hears a door opening, she dashes right back, hugging onto Boxo. She claims her job is to carry him around, so she insists on taking him, and Hulami ends up letting her take him. Lamas tries her best, and Boxo realizes she's trying so hard to overcome her fears, just so they can be together. He wants to help her out, so he produces the smell of coffee to help relax her, and he plays music to calm her down. She shows off her newfound confidence to the others, and Hulami tells her she's ready for the next step, telling her to do it without Boxo, but she instantly refuses. Kelroy returns, and we see he has brought back the band of bears, as well as Miguel. Boxo wonders if he'll be able to communicate in such a big group, but it seems he has improved. The group has a meeting, and Kelroy reminds them that their goal is to defeat the boss of the area, the King of Souls, suggesting that they go out looking for it during the day. They head out exploring together, but after just a while, they are soon surrounded by monsters. However, the group is prepared and is easily able to handle them. After several more days, the monsters seem to just ignore Boxo, but there is suddenly a zombie boy that approaches him. It seems the boy wants his food, so he ends up giving him a drink, but the boy just bites the bottle because he isn't able to open it, but he manages to get through. The next night, the same boy comes back, so Boxo gives him another drink. He keeps coming back every night, and Boxo starts to enjoy his visits. One night while camping outside during their exploration, Boxo wonders how the boy is doing, but the boy manages to find him. However, Akka and Shiro are on watch, and the boy gets taken out. Boxo feels bad about this, but he knows it's not Akka's fault. They find he had a coin on him, and they wonder if he was trying to buy something. After some more time, the group has a lead on where the boss is. They start discussing their strategy. Kelroy reveals that the Soul King is a magic user that can use multiple different elements. Kulami wonders how he plans to deal with it, but Kelroy thinks Boxo's barrier would be the perfect defense against its magic. Boxo agrees with his plan, and they all have a toast before they head out. The group heads off, and they approach the Soul King's location. They scout from a distance and see the Soul King, but there are also countless monsters in their way. Kelroy thinks they'll need to take them out before fighting the boss, but Sui thinks it'll be tough to fight so many. Boxo gets an idea, turning into a gasoline machine, and Hulami wonders what he's trying to tell them. She sprays out some of the gas, examining it, and they soon realize that it's flammable. The group prepares to fight, throwing bottles of the gas, covering all of the monsters, and the flaming skulls set everything on fire. The group charges through with Boxo's barrier, and they head straight for the boss. The Soul King attacks them with lightning magic, but Boxo's barrier manages to withstand it. Kelroy and Sui attack, but the Soul King creates walls that stop the attack, and the walls even split up the group. Lamas and Boxo are by themselves, but Lamas charges at the boss. The Soul King blasts her with ice, but Boxo easily blocks it. The Soul King is surprised they can stop his magic, and he tries using wind to blow them away, but Lamas is able to withstand it, thanks to her blessing of strength. The boss tries to bury her, splitting the ground underneath her, and Lamas starts to fall, but Boxo quickly transforms into cardboard, and Lamas manages to jump back out, just before the ground closes. 
The Soul King prepares to attack again, but he's suddenly interrupted by an arrow, and we see the others boosting Sui up over the wall. Lamas takes her chance, and she uses Boxo to land a finishing blow. The group celebrates their victory, but we see the Soul King on the floor cursing at them. Kelroy steps on him, preparing to finish him off, but there's suddenly a darkness from the sky as a black orb drops onto them. Everyone panics, and Boxo's barrier takes massive damage, but it eventually stops. Miguel and Calroy get back up, but when Calroy tries to grab his hat, there are vines that suddenly emerge, taking the Soul King's remains and forming an orb in the sky. The orb dissolves, and another skeleton monster emerges, but it seems to know Boxo is from another world. Lamas wonders who he is, so he introduces himself as the Netherlord. He examines the Soul King's coin, but finds no use for it and just throws it away. Lamas wonders what he is after, but the Netherlord says he's just hunting, just like they are hunting the dungeon bosses. Meanwhile, Miguel sneaks away, and he suddenly launches a surprise attack, but it has no effect and he gets blown away. Hulami rides in on the carriage, telling them all to run, and she throws a bottle of Boxo's gas. The Netherlord wonders what she's doing, but Sui follows up with a flaming arrow, causing an explosion. The group takes the chance to run, but the Netherlord blasts them, and he grabs Hulami, recognizing her as a threat. He grabs Sui as well, and he proceeds to shock them both. Lamas rushes to them, but she's too late, as the Netherlord drops them to the ground. Lamas is devastated at the sight, and she charges in, but the Netherlord avoids all of her attacks. Lamas wonders what they should do, and Boxo comes up with a plan, but he worries that it might not work. The Netherlord counterattacks with his magic, but Boxo stops it just in time. Lamas tells him that she believes in him, giving him confidence. Boxo transforms into his balloon machine, filling his barrier with balloons, but the Netherlord tells them it's futile, as it charges up his ultimate technique. Boxo shoots out Lamas from his barrier, but he uses his balloons as a distraction. Lamas takes this chance, and she lands a kick on the Netherlord's staff, managing to shatter it. The Netherlord decides to retreat, and he disappears with a cloud of dust. Lamas rushes to check up on Hulami, reminding her of their promise to stay together. Calroy gets back up, and he quickly checks on Sui. He refuses to let her die, and he tries to give her CPR. Boxo realizes there's a chance to save them, and he turns into an emergency defibrillator. Lamas and Calroy are confused by his new form, and Boxo thinks there's no time to explain how to use it, so he quickly spends his points to learn the telekinesis skill, and he starts moving it with his mind. Boxo also spends the rest of his points to boost his luck stat, to increase the chance of success, and he shocks Hulami to jumpstart her heart. Boxo worries he was too late, but she ends up waking up. Sui is also saved, and Calroy is overjoyed. They make it back to the village, and report to the director. The director notes that he has only read about the Netherlord from old records, but believes he's one of the Demon Lord's generals. Boxo gets worried hearing this, thinking the Demon Lord would be even stronger. Lamas returns to the inn, where Monami instantly rushes to her, wondering if she's okay, after fighting against a monster that was stronger than a dungeon boss. News of the encounter spreads throughout the village, and all the people praise Boxo for saving Hilami and Sui. Meanwhile, we see Miguel as he is approached by the bears. They wonder what he plans to do next, and Miguel thinks about how he was defeated, but he swears to get even stronger so that he can protect his comrades. The bears are happy to hear this, and Mikan tells him that the director is even calling for backup, so there will be a ton of other hunters coming to help. But this only makes Miguel more nervous, since he still has trouble talking to new people. We see Calroy reflecting upon the encounter. He notes that he was ready to give up his life for the sake of his wish, but after seeing Sui on the verge of death, he can't handle his friends dying, so he starts to reconsider his goal. But he's joined by the rest of his team, who say it was their own choice to follow him, so they tell him not to worry. The next day, we see Lamas walking with Boxo, but Boxo wonders where they are going. She ends up taking him back to the lake where they first met, and she reflects on everything they've been through together. She thanks him for always protecting her, but he thinks about how people were hurt in their last fight. However, Lamas tells him to focus on everything that he's done, and that it was all thanks to him that Sui and Hilami survived. Boxo is touched by how much she cares about him, and Sui and Hilami suddenly appear. Lamas wonders what they are doing there, 
and the two suddenly kiss Boxo to thank him. Lama starts freaking out, but Hulami tells her she should also thank him, since he has helped her the most. Lamas approaches Boxo, but she gets too embarrassed to do it. However, Sui and Hilami push her in, and she has a moment with Boxo. Lamas runs off, chasing after Hilami, and Boxo is left thinking about how his life being reincarnated as a vending machine isn't so bad. But that's where this video ends. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.